Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin on the Majority Report. Want to welcome back to the program Crystal Ball. She's the co-host of Breaking Points, obviously. Crystal, thanks so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, guys. Thanks for coming um, on. Let's start uh, with, I get, I mean, Tim Walsh was picked this week. It, it feels like it's been, it's been uh, months, but everything's been condensed in so many dates. What, uh, just your take, broadly speaking, on... I guess walls and then yeah. the implications of that pick, both in terms of like what it means within the context of the democratic coalition and the implications, of what it's going to mean on the race. Um, well, first, obviously I was cheering for him to be picked um, because I thought he was the best choice, not only electorally, but because it really does signal a sort of different direction for the democratic party. And so I was utterly shocked that they actually made that choice. Yeah. I mean, think about it. They had the choice of the like, technocratic Obama clone guy, which is the choice that they would have made 99% of the time throughout my entire life. And instead, they went with the guy who was the choice of labor, who, when he got a one seat majority in the legislature, announced that he was going to do the LFG agenda and actually use his power, which is the part that to me find is like the most astonishing because typically the Democratic Party, what they love to do is they embrace an agenda that sounds very much like what Tim Walls did in the state of Minnesota. But then they come up with a million excuses why it can never happen. And it's the Republicans, it's the parliamentarian, it's the filibuster, it's whatever. And so here you have a person who, when he had power, actually wanted to use it. So that was the part that to me is the most significant in terms of a break. And the other thing is, listen, with Kamala Harris, we all know who she is. She's the political opportunist. She doesn't appear to have any real core values. So this was the first most important signal of whether the pieces of the domestic Biden agenda that I support, and I know you guys support, that were a positive move away from the Obama administration, was that a blip on the radar? Or is that, in fact, the direction that the politically expedient politician will take at this point? And I think Tim Walls is an early indication that not that she wants to be FDR, but that through a hard nosed, cold hearted, politically expedient calculus, she surveyed the landscape and was pushed by Obama and Nancy Pelosi and others and said, actually, this is the type of candidate that serves my own selfish political interests the best. And to me, that's tremendously exciting. Tremendously. Yep. And I, I will say that, I mean, the the reporting, as you mentioned, indicates that she really appreciated the fact that he used his political capital and actually governed. And the fact that Pelosi was appreciative of him, too. And you have everyone from AOC to Fetterman saying, well, we like this guy. And oh, Manchin. Really, I mean, right. right. Manchin, it's, yeah. it's insane. <laughs> Did I not say Mansion just right there? Uh, right. Fetterman? I meant Fetterman. Manchin. I meant Mansion. I apologize. Uh, I meant Mansion. Yeah, everyone from Mansion to AOC saying we like this guy. It means that he has a lot of goodwill, I think, in Congress and on Capitol Hill. I think that's part of why Pelosi was in favor of him. And both the fact that he operated with urgency in Minnesota to actually govern and enact policies that Democrats wanted, and the fact that he potentially has these relationships on Capitol Hill, where he could be Go a conduit for her to Congress to get an agenda through versus what Biden was for Obama, which was sa the same pitch. But Biden was just like Senate foreign relations guy. I'm going to give Mitch McConnell the farm and let's go. Uh, let's develop something that is bipartisan for the sake of bipartisanship versus his posture. I much prefer a walls being the executive branch's uh, conduit to Congress versus Biden's philosophy. I do think this is a positive signal in the shift of like Democrats may, with their targeting of these Midwestern governors too, actually be interested in governing and doing something uh, with their political capital. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say about it. First of all, I think it's important to be clear because it, he was the most progressive of the choices, but it's not like anything he did in Minnesota was wild and crazy. Like this is bread and butter mainstream democratic priorities a child tax credit free school lunches like being good to labor just sort of the basics of what democrats actually claim to support it's just that he actually did it but you know i'm really i've been really thinking about okay well this does go against the choice of walls goes against my perception of the democratic party and specifically democratic party elites like nancy pelosi and barack obama so where was the model off? What do they see in him, which I'm sure is something different than what we see in, in him? And 
I think it was a couple things. I do wonder with Obama, if it is literally just he found the Josh Shapiro impression of him really grating and annoying and put him off personally. Like if it was me, that would be very irritating to be um, on a personal level. But I also think they ran the numbers. We know they did polling. They did not find that Josh Shapiro, I think if Shapiro, if they looked at and were like, okay, well, this guy's going to give us Pennsylvania, I think that would have been very difficult to resist. But they looked at the numbers and reportedly he didn't give them any sort of an electoral advantage. And I think we also have to give credit to the uncommitted movement and all of the people who have been raising their voices in opposition to the Biden-Harris policy, um, pro-genocide policy with regard to Israel and Gaza, because I think they also had a sense of we don't want to we don't want to destroy the burgeoning potential unity we have. We don't want to rip off a scab that, you know, has for the moment a little bit subsided by picking the dude who literally compared these protesters to the KKK. Now that has run into a brick wall with Kamala's own treatment of the protesters this week. But I do think that there should be a lot of um, I think we really have to give a lot of praise to those who've been organizing and pushing because without that pressure, I'm not sure that we do end up with the Tim Walls pick. Yeah, I, I I agree with that, and I think um, we should also note the, the the first like real shot across the bow against Shapiro came from fifty education uh, organizations, uh, at least a ha- three or four at least off the top of my head came from Pennsylvania, and so I mean if you're if you're that committed to education that you're willing to say. Our governor, whom we probably rely on for some uh, or, you know, in the past have relied on for some um, uh, funding, we're going to come out publicly and sign a letter that says, do not pick this guy because his education priorities are messed up. Um, that, that I imagine, also weighed heavily. I mean, I think it's, in, it's you know, and we should say, and we've been saying for a while, like, they're all DEI picks, right? There was no women uh, <laughs> in, in, in even contemplated the idea of a person of color was never contemplated. This had to be a white uh, guy. That was what was stated. Um, in many respects, Joe Biden was a DEI pick as well oh, yeah. for Barack oh, yeah. Obama. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. And so that, I think his like flirtations with segregationists and like opposing yep. busting, well, that was a positive in favor of Joe Biden is like, oh, this will reassure the like somewhat racist white moderates. hundred <laughs> percent. And we can go back to we can go back to Joe Lieberman. Because Joe Lieberman, in some respects, was also there to basically, supposedly to provide the moral ballast for uh, Al Gore, because Joe Lieberman was the greatest critic of uh, Bill Clinton in the Senate, you know, at least on the Democratic side of him being, you know, uh, unchaste or whatever it was that uh, that Joe Lieberman found a problem with. Um, And, you know, like it's it's unclear to me. Exactly. There's so many different stories out there as to like, you know, Shapiro supposedly called up and said, I'm not sure I want to be number two. That which... That's cope for him. He is yes. saving face at that point for the public. <laughs> well, honestly, I didn't, I didn't even want the job. This was supposedly, <laughs> this was supposedly <laughs> you know, before uh, it came out. Now, uh, it could be cope. It could be um, from him. It could also be coming from the the uh, Harris people to sort of downplay the implications of why they they didn't go with him. I mean, mm-hmm. we'll never know all this stuff. All we can look at is what you, you're basically saying, Crystal, which is there was enough problems. It, it became he became too much of a painful choice with not enough sort of justification for it for the the you know uh, the campaign or the, the the nascent administration to expend political capital on, and that's basically the way that you win these battles on a like like a week to week month to month year to year basis uh from any type of constituency but that's the model is that you're not shifting the ideology of this you know uh i think you're right in terms of like harris being a bit of a cipher you're not shifting your ideology you're just cutting off you're just limiting her basically her choices Mm -hmm. um so that they go in the direction you want them to yeah, that's that's exactly right. And there's something else that I find to be such an important break with Tim Walls. Um, he provides incredible class diversity. Uh, here's yep. a guy who doesn't own a, any real estate, crypto, stocks, bonds, nothing, has like a teacher's pension, you know, earns a sufficient living. But this is not a guy or a family who's living high on the hog. 
you know, actually relates to the America, average American in a very real and tangible way, um, you know, has the a background as a, a teacher and as a veteran, which is in contrast to every other single Democrat we've ever put on the ticket who all have legal backgrounds going back to Jimmy Carter. So that part also, to me, is really significant, important. You know, his quote unquote lived experience will be different because of um, that context and uh, and his own you know commitment to service and the way that he's chosen to go about his life. So I find that piece to actually be really important too, both in terms of what it could spell for the agenda. I think I think that is part of why he was so aggressive about using power when he had it, but also in terms of his electoral abilities, because he does have that just comfortable in his own skin, speaks in a way that people find approachable and relatable and not cringy and off-putting. You know, it gets thrown around a lot, but he genuinely does have an authenticity that's an extremely rare commodity um, in Washington in particular. And does he have the ability constitutionally to be the number two to a woman? I mean, I, I think that that's actually maybe a, a, a part of perhaps her personal comfort with him, right? Mm -hmm. if, I just get like a vibe. If I'm having a meet, if I'm choosing outside of politics, is someone to be my subordinate in this instance? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Tim Walls or Josh Shapiro. <laughs> Tim Walls is just, he's the football coach that wanted to, uh, be the advisor for the Gay Straight Alliance in the 90s because he felt that that would be an important signal. Like, his vision of masculinity, right? Um, especially in contrast to J.D. Vance, which we can get into, um, and of family. It's so... I've been calling him a fa Frank Capra character from uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Like, it's this very kind of, like, wholesome, idealized image of, you know, what it means, I think, both to be a citizen, he's really civically minded, but also what it means to be kind of, like, a male uh, leader, right? In a way that it's... With Trump and all his bravado and J.D. Vance and all his, like let's control women that contrast of being of a real true family man versus their weirdness plus mm -hmm. i think how that working relationship could be with her that's that's also my assessment of it as well i, I think that's so true and it's something i've been thinking about uh, a lot too emma because there's been all this discourse about like you know the the young men pipeline to the right wing, the Andrew Tates and the Aiden Rosses of the world and all that, and the need for positive masculine identities that have a, a liberal or left bent. And I do think Tim Walls is kind of a perfect example of that. Like his identity is deeply masculine. You know, everybody shares these memes about him, like fixing your carburetor, like messing with the wiring in the attic, not to say women can't do those things, but you know, it's this sort of like traditional view of positive masculinity that he fits into very comfortably. As you said, the, the football coach, you know, the everybody knew that like cool teacher who took some extra time with them and was really important to them in their lives. He has that energy and that vibe. And it is a distinct contrast with J.D. Vance. I mean, J.D. Vance, so he, he wants to position himself as this like right populist. And in certain ways, you know, he'll speak favorably about some policies or he'll talk about economics differently than like a, a Ronald Reagan conservative. But Matt Burning made this point. I think it's a really true one. The problem for anyone who is even pretending to be interested in a different economic direction for the Republican Party is that the only thing the Republican Party really cares about at this point is like owning the libs and worshiping Donald Trump. So he has to frame any of his quote unquote pro-family policy in the language of being like, edgy, subversive, mm -hmm. flagrantly offending, you know, a large segment of the population a la childless cat ladies, or the policy has to be really like weird and off-putting, like the giving parents more votes than non-parents, which is obviously brazenly unconstitutional. Because if he just was like, yeah, I support paid family leave and child tax credit, that's all coded lib, and he can't do that. So it ends up being weird that's where you end up being and and i'm you know in terms of political talent like he's just got this he's he's devoid of he's anti-charismatic he's tr and on the trump campaign i don't know what they're doing right now so they're like sending jd vance around to speak to like five people in a parking lot and <laughs> trump is just hanging out at mar-a-lago and going on aiden ross's stream and whatever so i don't know but uh the jd vance pick to me you just have to look at his negative favorability 
to know that this was a one of the most disastrous vice presidential picks that has ever been made. It is a clear drag on the ticket. Trump himself clearly knows that. That's why I wouldn't say that he would be ready on day one and instantly went to like, well, this doesn't really matter anyway. Um, and it helps it helps crystallize the Democratic framing of this ticket as fringe, weird, off-putting, repellent, et cetera. What do you think about that? Because, you know, the um, about, you know, uh, you and I have been following this stuff for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, Emma, too. But, uh, you know, uh, but the this is I mean, this change, you know, like, look, Jay Vance is a VC. The guy mm -hmm. has never made a I would uh, wager that he has never made a dollar as a W-2. <laughs> Like, you know, he, it's for him, it's all his income, uh, or at least the, the, the great amount of it has, um, has come prior to his time in the Senate, um, through basically, you know, uh, through the capital gains tax. Um, and you know, he can profess these sort of like, uh, populist, um, uh, positions, uh, but he is at the epicenter of the financialization of our economy in a way that, of, you know, fundamentally ends up hurting workers. I mean, it just, it just does. That's right. um, but the, to have the Democrats attack on such a sort of vibe level, is not something that we've seen Democrats do in any way. Like, you know, this is, it, it really, it, you know, I want to say it's flipped, except for it's not like outside of immigration, really. The Republicans are even referencing anything about policy. It used to be the Democrats would just talk about policy, would not get to the sort of the vibes thing. I remember Ronald Reagan, you know, morning in America and the the whole concept of like optimism and, you know, get rid of the get out of the Jimmy Carter malaise and, you know, uh, Clinton sort of like uh, repositioned. But was firmly sort of like, you know, no government uh, or limited government type of camp. This is a, like a fundamentally different way of Democrats, uh, running and they seem to have embraced it. Um, on top of this dynamic where there doesn't seem to be this fealty, they'll say unity, but there's not the fealty of like, I can work with the Republicans. Being I mean, partisan. walls will say it, but, yeah. but there's not, it's not, it's like a, it's sort of like just a, it's, it's like a backfill a little bit. It's not the, you know, Biden, this was Biden's sort of like, yeah. uh, and, and for generations, it feels like Democrats have been the best thing about me. I'll say Republicans are bad, but I also say that they're pretty good. You know, like it's, right. it's weird. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I appreciate that the Democrats have shifted away from the language that was used by Hillary Clinton and that was used by Joe Biden of like, you know, it was very, it was very moralizing. And I think that was not unjustified. But I also think after so many years of, you know, the the really heavy moral of restoring the soul of democracy language from Biden, I think to just cast them off and sort of laugh in their face is like, what a bunch of weird freaks. I think it lands. And I think it feels I think it it lands in a very sort of cutting way that Republicans are scrambling to deal with. Like they clearly hate this label because forever Republicans have been the ones that have centered themselves as the police of what's normal, quote unquote, normal. Right. Right. This is the quiet majority, uh, the silent exactly. majority. And exactly. And so to have that dynamic flipped where I think arguably the reason that they underperformed in 2022 is because people did think they were so freaking weird with their, you know, extreme abortion stances and stop the steal and this crew of just like off the wall wackos that they nominated to run for various prominent positions. The overall sense was what a bunch of weird freaks. And so when you put J.D. Vance, who very much inhabits this, these like weird online subculture freakish worlds on the ticket and you've already got a guy in Donald Trump who's obviously very weird, it lands. Now, I think you should pair that. And I'm hoping that with the Tim Walls pick, they will lean more into an affirmative economic message because voters still say 
like the economy, it still is about the economy. That still is the number one priority. And I would personally, you know, like to know what Kamala Harris plans to do. And is she going to keep Lena Khan or is she going to bend to the billionaire pressure campaign? Those things are really important. And I think they could be a di difference maker in a race that appears to be very, very tight. But in terms of the vibes and the, the stance and the overall framing and branding, I think it's been very clever. I think it's been extremely effective. And they're positioning themselves as like the joyful warriors versus these, you know, dark freak fringe right. overly online group of people. I think it that's why you see Kamala Harris's favorability just dramatically skyrocketing this race flipping on a dime overnight. And why I feel at this point they are they do have an advantage, even though I wouldn't take anything um, for granted, certainly. Hey, folks, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our daily show. We do it every day at 12 p.m. Eastern for about two and a half hours. We even take phone calls. You should check that out.